Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Designers for Learning. Today is a webcast that we're hosting on July 28th, 2015. This is a kickoff planning session for the next iteration of a service learning project we plan to have up and running in the first part of 2016. And so what we've done is assembled a team, a panel of subject matter experts and instructional designers um, that uh, who may or may not, hopefully will, be interested in working with us as we design the experience and then also in turn begin facilitating it in the spring. Um, so um, we'll have a moment in, it, uh, in a couple slides for everybody to, once you kind of get a lay of the land of what I'm talking about, to introduce yourself and um, describe what your background is in the topic that we're talking about and where you may, may or may not find yourself uh, falling in line in terms of what role you may want to take on. Um, but I just want to go over real quickly what the agenda is. Uh, as I said, it's very much kind of a lay of the land discussion, talking about what the goal of the projects are uh, is, um, some of our questions that um, with, as instructional designers, we, we start everything off with questions. So we unfortunately right now, I, we have more questions than answers, um, but I'll, I'll give you a little bit, I'll tip my hand, hand a little bit and give you a, uh, some idea of what some my answers are to some of these questions and we'll see how that evolves over time. I wanna talk a little bit about what the project design and facilitation needs will be on this project. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about specifically what volunteer assistance we need from a subject matter expert standpoint as well as design standpoint. Lay out a rough time frame. Um, and then, um, as I mentioned, turn everything over to those that are uh, participating with us as well to talk about what your interest may be in terms of volunteering. So um, I know there are going to be some people who are very familiar what we what we do at Designers for Learning, but for those who aren't, I just rather than having um, uh, taking time out of our time today, uh, I just point you to our design studio. It's at studio.designersforlearning.org. And we've um, facilitated three service learning projects to date, and it will give you a sense for how we manage these virtual service learning projects. And um, like I said, if you have any, or you can pretty much get a feel from it from looking on the website, but if you do have any questions after we're done, um, you know, we can certainly circle back um, to that. But again, studio.designersforlearning.org is where our home base is. So um, as I mentioned, this is a next iteration of a service learning project. We've actually done three projects. Bonnie Shelnitz uh, joining us. Uh, Jill Stefaniak is here as well. Um, and Jason, uh, all people who've worked with us in, uh, in some capacity on a prior project. We had a client, one specific client, Grace Centers of Hope. Um, they uh, provide adult basic education courses to folks within their uh, program. They're um, a homeless shelter. And so we pretty much geared our efforts toward what I'm terming backfilling um, needed resources, needed GED resources to support their adult basic edu education program. And what we'd like to do now going forward, looking um, into 2016 and beyond, is to take what our, the work we've done and take it to a broader scale and um, get a, a much larger development of adult basic education resources, specifically open educational resources. And we'll talk a minute about who that tar target audience may be. Um, but one of the also interesting aspects of what we like to contemplate is pr uh, prior to this, we've had a fairly small cohort of around between a dozen to maybe 20 students working with us uh, at any one given semester within the project. And uh, we're, we're very much interested in trying this model out on a much bigger scale within an open MOOC where we would attract literally hundreds of students. And uh, obviously that will change the, change the way we need to facilitate and design the experience. So why this project? I definitely don't need to spend time, I don't think, with this group on why we need to do this, but um, I just I always have to have one compelling slide <laughs> in our session. And, and really we're working toward this, this humongous problem we have, and this is a very US-centric slide, but uh, this, the problem obviously persists across the globe. But in the US alone, it's just, to me, unacceptable. We have 30 million US adults without a high school credentials. And um, I've been told many, many times when I've told people we're working on this project, uh, they say something along the lines of, wow, you picked a very unsexy or the least sexy segment of education. Uh, and really speaking to that point that there's really no money, unfortunately, um, that's being devoted to this relative to other segments of education. I pulled off some statistics that you can uh, see on the bottom of the screen or there were the sources. But um, unfortunately, adult ed receives just a small fraction of the, um, the funding of other, uh, you, you, in the U.S., of other, other age groups, K-12 or higher education. 
And then why uh, also it's really important for me to point out too, tying back to what we did for the work with Grace Centers of Hope, there have been substantial changes to the GED test and to the underlying standards. And so unfortunately, a lot of those folks who are in the trenches doing this work don't have access to good resources right now to help them. So some of the many design questions that we've got, um, who are we targeting? As I stated before, we very much were focused on the GED preparation side of things. However, there are a lot of pathways to high school equivalency. Um, and a lot of different people are trying different things, uh, different credentialing uh, through community colleges or whatever, charter schools, adult charter schools, different things. Um, so those are the questions we need to think about as a design team once we get underway. Are we going to continue to work pretty much preparing people for the GED or are we thinking about other pathways and other um, learning needs? Uh, along with that then is what are we aligning our instruction to? The college and career readiness standards um, roughly align with the GED. They say that it aligns perfectly, but actually if you lay them to go out together, it's not. <laughs> For one thing, the, the college and career readiness standards do not include science, or at least they didn't last I checked, so you need to go to the next gen science standards. Um, so these are all, again, uh, devil in the detail type things that we need to think through, but it, they're pretty important in terms of helping us understand what it is we're actually um, working, working toward. And then it's the kind of the common age old thing in our service learning uh, process here is what will these deliverables actually look like? Um, up to this point, um, we've pretty much had everything in a PowerPoint template. Um, we've struggled with that saying it's, you know, there's a lot more technology out there, a lot more media we could be incorporating. Um, and a lot of that then depends on answering questions such as who are our end users and our tutors and our learners and what type of technology may they have on their end. Um, so those are the, some of many, many, many questions. And at this point, to help us kind of refine and put a box around what I'm talking about, at least in the short term, certainly we're going to be continuing, continuing to target the GED preparation um, and focusing on both the learner experience as well as those tutors in the trenches. Uh, it's been described to us many, many times as being like a one-room schoolhouse model where it's a tutor working with people at various levels of preparation toward their GED. And um, so certainly I think that will always be part of our, our goal is to make sure that we provide resources for, for those folks. Um, we also um, are, seem to be doing a good job on hitting what I'm calling the quick bite module. So 30 minutes upwards at maximum of an hour of instructional time. So it's a, maybe a, a little module that someone would sit down and work on to backfill some uh, particular learning need that they may have. Um, and again, aligned and mapped to the standards that we decide are appropriate. And um, I think we'll probably continue to our focus on making sure that what we're working on in particular, we're all instructional designers uh, at heart, is the robust design, meaning that the instruction we're creating is effective and it's efficient. And if it's not pretty in terms of, and robust in terms of the development and the prettiness, that's something that will, you know, will chew on, push that can down the road a little bit. So just to um, spend just a little bit of time, and I don't want to, uh, we could really spend a lot of time dissecting our facilitation process before and going, uh, going forward. But in a nutshell, we selected students through a volunteer, uh, call for volunteers. Um, once the cohort was selected, they went through an orientation of about two weeks very content heavy, um, understanding what the design needs are, what the constraints were, who the learners are. Um, they were then asked to prepare as a team, a small team, two to three designers, a design plan. Um, they then turned that into developing a prototype, which was evaluated, feedback was given from the client, which then turned into the final deliverable. This whole process took about 15 to 16 weeks. And in terms of pinch points, um, where we've noticed things uh, could, could go smoother or just maybe they can't, but they just are inherently a pinch point, the selection process for us, um, was, it was, it's very, it's very time consuming and unfortunately we weed out probably some very good people. Um, we, I think, Jason, I don't know, we have about 40 or so applicants last time and we chose 12, so that's not so cool that <laughs> we had great <laughs> great students who were interested in participating and we just didn't have the capacity to facilitate their participation. Um, also, the, uh, once, you, once you started getting into team-based virtual um, situations with folks who don't know that each other, that gets a little messy. Um, and they spend a lot of time working on the team dynamics and things like that. So creating those, that design plan, the first team deliverable is pretty painful to watch and I, you know, we feel pretty bad for them trying to get that accomplished. 
Um, and the same with, um, you know, preparing their, their, their uh, storyboard or their prototype and then all the way through. They pretty much have things worked out by the time they get to their design deliverable, but like I said, it's a fairly messy process watching that happen. Some of the successful things, though, uh, we do take great use of webinars. Um, our team mentors have been outstanding working with our designers. Um, Jason and his crew last um, year did a great job having a lot of one-to-one -one interaction. So those things I think we do pretty pretty well and it seems to help the process. And we also uh, rely pretty heavily on individual designer reflections. That's the way we can touch base with a uh, designer on an individual basis. So, so these are some of the things that are pinch points and some of the things that we'd like to make sure that we continue on. So this is a really messy slide and it's going to be really hard for you to read this, but basically I'm trying to show here that uh, the overlay of, of what I think needs to, to change and some of the things that need to stay um, in place. And as I mentioned, I love the designer reflections, they're doing well, we somehow have to have strong mentorship, we have to somehow be able to keep in some type of synchronous webinar where we get folks back on, on, uh, on the same page, but from there, we're, uh, I'm kind of open to, to suggestion on where we, where we tweak and refine things. And so one thing Jill, and, Jill Stefaniak and I have um, roughly laid out is this notion that we would have two phases to the experience. The first phase would be an open MOOC on the canvas.net platform. Um, we've been told the first time you offer a course there, you can expect 600, but they actually, on the upper end, ask us to cap it at 25. So 2,500, uh, so we don't know. This is a very big question mark what the number of people may be. But the idea being eliminating the selection process and basically throwing the students the design problem, saying here's what the design challenge is, and then having them come up with some type of um, design solution. And I'm not sure where, at this point what that representation would be, whether it would be a design plan or it would be a prototype or a storyboard or whatever we can come up with. But basically that experience would take about five weeks. And through the process of people just naturally saying that this isn't my cup of tea and I'm done, we go from, let's say, 600 down to maybe we'll end up with 50 people who then would come with us to the second phase, which would be more of a selected cohort based on their participation in the MOOC. So did they complete all their individual reflections? Did they turn in something that looks reasonably like a design plan or whatever it is that we ask them to prepare? And then this is the group that we'd spend more of the one-on-one -on -one time with. Um, so why would students want to do this? That's one of the big things when Jill and I were talking. Why, if we're going to change the game on folks, how will that affect how students, meaning the, the not the GED learners, but the service learners, how they would want to interact with us? And um, really, I think uh, the, the, the uh, selling point would be for the open MOOC, that first phase of the five weeks, is we're saying, okay, one of the hardest things to do as an instructional designer is to get your head around the design problem and to then to come up with that first iteration of what the solution may be. And so that's what we're really giving folks the opportunity to do within the first five weeks, is to get your head around what the design need is and then come up with that first cut of what the solution may be. Then clearly the second part of the cohort is they will then have a, a true deliverable that they can include in their portfolio, talk about during a job interview or whatever it may be. So I don't think we're really I don't think we're really changing the rules of the game too much on folks by um, changing our process. So here's what now, where I'm just going to be quiet and let everyone else talk. Here's our needed assistance. Um, we would really like to be able to offer this in the spring of 2016, hopefully starting February 1st. And so to make that happen, we need to assemble a team of designers to help us redesign this experience. There's a MOOC that needs to be designed. The cohort that needs to be designed. Um, we certainly need a crop of very dedicated <laughs> subject matter experts to help us make sure we're on the right path, that we're designing instruction that people actually need, um, help us determine what our needs and our goals and our constraints really are in this project. And then once things get underway for the MOOC and the um, and also the cohort facilitation in the spring, we just need a lot of hands on deck to help us, you know, I guess I'm mixing metaphors here, but um, to keep the trains running. So basically to make sure that um, the MOOC participants are doing what they're supposed to be doing and that they're, we're answering feedback questions and support questions and that we're there to provide assessment of the students' work. Um, in terms of the time frame, I'd really love to have confirmation from those who are ready to, to sign on board as volunteers with us um, by the, the 15th of August. 
Um, and then I'd like to have about two months then of, of pretty solid design work where we're really, um, you know, and again, it depends on how much time you have to, available to this process to be able to help us, but the, the su subject matter experts would really be in the trenches um, figuring out what these aims are. What are our deliverable aims that we need these service learners to create? Um, and what, what's, what, what are some of the things that should be part of what they design? Um, and then from the design team standpoint, um, working to, with our, we have uh, partners at uh, canvas.net who have already been assigned to us, that we will work with them to make sure that we are getting everything up on their platform and that it's all ready to go. Um, and they really like to have about an eight week lead time at Canvas, so that puts us pretty much by a November 15th kind of drop deadline if we want to have that eight week window because they, they market the, pro, the, the MOOC pretty heavily. Um, they keep it up on their website, they have distribution and, and plug the course. So we really pretty much are looking at a drop dead to have everything designed up on their platform by November 15th. So, so now, now I will officially be quiet. So um, I don't know, where, where should we start? I don't know, Ruth, did you, you're kind of the newest one to the group here. Do you want to introduce yourself and, and give us a sense for what your background is in this area? Sure, sure, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so hi, I'm Ruth Sugar, and I work at American Institutes for Research um, in our Workforce and Lifelong Learning Division. Um, and my background is in adult basic education, so I've um, worked at a lot of community-based um, adult education and literacy programs, um, doing adult basic ed and um, ESL instruction and program coordination and um, program administration. And um, <clears throat> I have been at AAR just for a year, but we just so happened to have completed um, at the end of June um, an OER STEM project uh, that had been going on for three years for the um, Office of Career and Technical Education uh, within ED. And so, um, you know, I think that there's definitely a lot of overlap in terms of things we've we learned through that project um, uh, in terms of resources that are helpful to instructors and to learners. Um, so, and also, sorry, I did um, complete a, a certificate in instructional design uh, last December. So I'm, I'm new to the, the technical um, aspect of online course design, but um, it's definitely an interest of mine that I want to grow in, so. Yeah, and I think you were at Stout, right? University of Wisconsin Stout, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, we have, yeah. We've, had, we've had students, you probably, um, some of your uh, people you graduated with or finished your certificate with were in our, um, in one of our cohorts, so <laughs> that's great. Oh, great. Yeah, probably, yeah. So um, in terms of what I laid out, how, and you said you just finished that project in June, how, did the, how does this type of project that we're talking about here align um, with the work that you were doing um, at, at AAR? Well, with that project, um, we had an online course, um, well, several courses that we created where we were having, um, what we were teaching adult educators about what OER are, and then also how to use them in the classroom. <clears throat> and through that process, um, they also were charged with creating um, OER for their students um, in science and math. And so, you know, I think just having a, a good understanding of what open educational resources are is helpful because a lot of people don't fully understand that, um, and then also seeing what they, as instructors in the classroom, found useful for their students and how they put things together. Um, I would say that probably the, the resources were more geared towards um, lesson plans that they developed and, and um, you know, did with their students versus a lot of, say, independent activity that learners just, you know, could take over and do themselves. So, but, um, but you know, there was some of that, but, but I, I can see that your focus is slightly different. You're trying to um, create materials that, that learners can really dive into more 
with um, autonomy and independence. So, and, and actually, you've hit on a really good point. That goes back to my sum of many questions. For our particular client mm -hmm. at Grace Centers of Hope, that's what their need was in particular. They kind of did the tape testing to figure out where folks were and then would um, send them off to work on some units. Um, but if we feel that it's you know given some of the uh, the different needs in terms of the tutoring, if you if you join us or if you participate with us and the subject matter experts feel that we should also pivot a little bit and and go down that path of of, uh, of more of the the development for the instructors and the tutors and for preparing resources that they may need, you know that's I'm very open to hearing that. Um, and that's one of the reasons we've opened it up to hear a greater audience uh, from a subject matter standpoint. Um, and I, I don't know, Jill or Jason or, or Bonnie, that you've um, been with us all the way along here. How does this sit with you? Change is always <laughs> different, uh, not always good, not always bad. But what you know, how, what do you think in terms of um, trying this approach? Well, I think it really depends on what the uh, client or audience's need happens to be. So uh, 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 instructional design is, and the theory of it and the application of it is to meet the needs of the learners. So um, if that includes uh, the instructors and learners, then that's the way you design it. So I think it, once that's decided, then we decide what that looks like. And then uh, that's what the design uh, plan and uh, final production uh, ends up being. So I, I, I'm, I guess I'm saying yes, <laughs> but it, it depends. It depends exactly. on what, uh, what we decide as a group is the need, and then we decide how we're going to meet the need. Yeah, what a, what a perfect designer's response, right? It depends, right? That's usually <laughs> yeah. Usually what we answer everything with. Um, and then Jill and Jason, and J um, I know I had a chance, Jill and Jason are both on our board and we had the opportunity to, to briefly discuss this yesterday. And do mm -hmm. either of you have any thoughts or comments um, that we didn't get to talk about yesterday? I, um, and I, I had to step out for a couple minutes. I had, a, I had a quick curious George back on for a baby <laughs> in another room. But, uh, um, uh, I, like, I like this idea. I think it will be good. And I kind of like the idea, too, of, if we can also kind of channel some of our efforts to focus on the instructors and the learners. I think it provides that holistic approach that perhaps um, we haven't always taken into account. I know in the past, a lot of our designers, especially the design students, had a really hard time when we presented constraints with them about what the learning environment would be for these learners, and they had a hard enough time with that. And I think it might also help, too, if they put in perspectives who are actually going to be the people that are going to be taking this information, taking this instruction, and then making sure that it's being facilitated correctly. And so I really like the idea of seeing what we can, what we can do and what resources we can provide. And I also love the idea of having subject matter experts in adult education because I think it makes our lives a lot easier. And we're not, we're not guessing and we're not doing all this research when we know that there are people there that actually know what the needs are. Um, I think it, it helps us and we can focus more on the instructional design aspects as well. And I think it just makes sure that everything's covered. And, you know, time, that's a great um, reminder. Um, as far as Ruth, Ruth is one, one person of three um, from, the, from a, AIR. What do you say? Is it AIR? Or what do you, what do you say? We, we say AIR. AIR. <laughs> but it's hard for me. <laughs> call it AIR occasionally, but we say AIR. <laughs> it's hard for me to get those uh, an acronym out. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> um, she's also uh, reached, we also reached out to Amanda Duffy and then um, Delphinia Brown. And I put a link in the chat room. Um, the three of you, the reason I found you is some work you'd done this spring at a conference, right, um, where you did, gave some presentations on adult basic education mm -hmm. and then again incorporating OER for, uh, for the instructors. So that's where I found them. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really, 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 really hoping that we can get <laughs> participation from, from your group and, um, and, and certainly spread the word. Uh, do you know, do you, are you the three kind of main folks that are into this kind of weird <laughs> OER stuff? Uh, other, other um, they're, uh, within our organization, yes, but we, through our project, we worked with, um, you know, 20 some uh, instructors who did the, the design of, of OER and went through the, the, the courses that I, I mentioned, the online courses. And then there was also um, two cohorts of instructors that reviewed resources and, you know, um, provided feedback on them. Uh, 
so I mean we so we have connections to a lot of people in the field as well and probably could um, give you some names of people that would be really good who are actually in the classroom so because none of us are currently in the classroom so right yes please do that's a yes that would be, <laughs> that would be yeah. the first thing that I, would I, I figured you would you would <laughs> just <enough. laughs> um, and, and Jason go ahead do you have any thoughts or on, and I guess in more particular the facilitation aspect of it how, how does this sit with you the fact that we'd be going from a cohort of 12 to 600 that scares, yeah, uh, that hopefully, scares me. Hopefully it's 600. And so I, I think that it's fantastic. I love it. It opens up the doors to more of a population of people getting involved, uh, more eyes on, on the project, and obviously more quality work because we get to handpick the quality work that we see. Uh, the only question or concern that I have is clearly identifying what the roles are. Um, and so when we say a facilitator, what does a facilitator do? What's their role? What's their responsibilities? When we say, because the faculty advisors are gone, we have SHMEs, which are fantastic. Uh, but then you mentioned people designing the Canvas platform. So for, for me, it, it would be better if we clearly identify what the roles are first, so that we have a clear idea of how the infrastructure looks to support 600 people as we funnel them through. Visually, how does that look? Um, systematically, how does that look? Uh, procedurally, how does that look? Uh, and that, that's something that we have to clarify, especially if we're dealing with uh, such a large population of people. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I think the roles will be very different between, at least in my initial opinion, between the 600 MOOC and then as people filter out and we're down to more what I'm calling a manageable cohort of maybe 25 to 30. I, I, MOOCs have a historical 1% to 3% um, retention rate. So <laughs> right off the bat, if you get rid of maybe right. 7%, you know, you, you want to have something that you're not you know, ignoring 97% right out of the gate, but, um, you know, that, that's kind of a reality of it. So that, that's, a, that's going to be an interesting dynamic between facilitating the MOOC versus then kind of more our traditional very hands-on approach that we will do on the selected cohort. But great points on that. Um, well, I'm kind of out of material. I, I, I guess the, just the next things I wanted to mention in terms of the reiterating really are the next steps. Um, I'll send this out to those, I think at about 15 people in our distribution list and some um, weren't able to join us today, obviously. And so I will send this out and ask everyone to take a, take a listen. Um, and if we can try to get everything roughly lined out so we at least have a core crew of designers a core crew of subject matter experts by the 15th of august i would be pretty happy certainly um anticipating that we'll have folks coming on board after that but at least having a core group where we can start getting some of this these as jason said starting out with some clarifying of roles and uh and goals and things like that and then i really again consider this as i mentioned a couple slides ago our first milestone really being this october 15th date of, um, of really getting it nailed down what we want the, the student designers to be delivering um, as, as part of their objective and then also um, thinking through what we need to get get ready for the canvas uh, installation <laughs> so um, with that so anybody have any other comments or questions um, first of all <laughs> Can I put anyone on this side? <laughs> so who, who is interested in, uh, in in moving forward with us? And at this point, do we have any hands up, or do you have more questions that you, you may want to talk to me about afterwards? The the question I have, uh, or I, I probably have several, but one question that seems to arise uh, is uh, when we're talking about this canvas. Uh, this is uh, an online environment to house the product, but it may not be a web delivered product. Is that correct? Instructional oh. product. Okay, Canvas is where we would host the MOOC. So where we would yeah. host the service learning experience. So okay. it's not where we would house the, the students deliverables ultimately. Right, okay. All right, and so the student deliverable, uh, depending on what decision uh, is made by the group, might be uh, a, uh, does a an instructional uh, let's say like you said a, an instructional component that can be delivered in the classroom with an instructor 
uh, and the students then, uh, uh, whoever designs this, would be designing what the instructor has to do and what the students have to do. Is that correct? Exactly. So okay. the, the idea would be, um, and I think at this point, Bonnie, you could probably answer as, as well as I, I think we have about 15 modules-ish uh, that yeah. we've developed. And so the ideal would be, say we could get another 40 developed uh, through this process. So now we're going to be able to start laying those out on a, on a web platform where if some, if I kind of think back to like CK12, um, the way they lay things out or sailor.org where it, if you know the, co the content area where you need in, um, information or instruction, you click on you know, whatever it would be, math, and then you need a, a fraction on, you know, subtraction mm -hmm. or whatever it may be, subtraction, you need a module on that, you can click on it, and then you'd have your resources available. And then to your point, the question becomes, is this something that, when I say a resource, that's a lot of different things. Is it going to be a PDF that someone could download and have, you know, is that, you, well, through our process of talking to our SMEs, is that, are they going to say, yeah, we really do kind of need it where we can just print it out as a PDF, or are they going to mm -hmm. say, no, we'd really rather have it where they kind of click through some screens um, online? So okay. I think that's kind of a to be to be determined question. Mm -hmm. And as you know, we, at this point, we pretty much work more toward having uh, PowerPoint uh, than the, the, the culminating the deliverable. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I will. I will leave. I won't put anyone else on this. <laughs> but um, definitely, Ruth. I really, really want to thank you so much, and I really invite you to the process. And I, I appreciate any help you can get in terms of give us in terms of spreading the word and, and getting us additional okay. names because um, we would love to have a panel. Ideally, I don't even know what the number would be. It'd be great if we could have seven, mm -hmm. eight, nine people that were, mm -hmm. were in the trenches with us helping us um, scope this out. So. Yeah, I do have one question. I'm just curious from the previous times that you've run this program about what the time commitment is for leads and um, instructional designers that volunteer. Yeah, it's, it's really um, varied. I'll, I'll just kind of go through the roles really quickly. Um, we, the student designers, we ask them to commit between 50, around 40 to 50 hours during the 15 weeks. So that's the, those are the service learners. And for the most part, that's what we end up with. Some spend a lot more time, like a, a lot, lot more time, but I think they may be compensating for team members who aren't. Uh, so let's just say that the average for a student is about 50. Um, and then Jason uh, worked as a, a facilitator working with a team of student designers and Jason I would assume for I think we were looking at about 60 to 80 hours is what you what I think you guys were guesstimating over the 16 weeks yeah probably and it depends on it depends on your style of, of facilitation too because um, you can be more laid back or you can be more hands-on you can meet weekly if you like and that's up to you so um, and then in terms so of our helps. Oh, sorry. And then in terms of our SME, no, um, Bonnie, you can help me out with this a little bit. We had Kim Phillip and Courtney Phillips uh, were our two SMEs at, at Grace Centers of Hope. And um, we uh, we had a, a period, as you'd imagine, at the beginning where we, Bonnie and um, myself and, and Kim and Courtney spent, I mean, I don't even know, Bonnie, 15, 20 hours maybe total scoping the project, determining what we needed. And then we usually called on Kim and Courtney maybe five hours a month during the facilitation, would you say, Bonnie? I, I would imagine. It's, I, I, I probably spent more time than they did in that I, I was the person who looked at the design very carefully. So uh, they were looking at the content and uh, uh, that specifically. So each one of them, so if you would combine that into uh, one group of man hours, it might be 20 hours, ten, about 10 hours each. Uh, were you saying per month or yeah, per, per yeah. month? Per month, yeah. yeah. And and Ruth, I think for, from this kind of the, the way we're changing things around, I, I do kind of envision. Um, and again, it's kind of a little hard, but let's okay. say for each person, let's say ten to fifteen hours of helping us scope the project. Let's call that like yeah, this, uh, right. Mm -hmm. um, this first part by October fifteenth. I would, I would think, I would like to see uh, if someone's really interested in helping us. I'd love them to commit to ten to fifteen hours of volunteer time up to the fifteenth of October to really help right. us find the scope of the project. And again, if we could get a team of like five to seven people doing that, that's like fifty plus hours of needs assessment. That's well more than I think we would need. And, so, and I would add to this 
this part that the people involved in this area need to know specifically what they uh, want because if it's too broad then the service learners have to spend a great deal of time questioning uh, uh, which you want them to question some but the the uh, the ones who want the instruction should have some clear, um, I guess, a clear vision uh, as to what they want to have as their uh, content and uh, objectives and final deliverable. And then the service learners will uh, spend time in questioning them mm -hmm. to get it down to more specifics, but don't let it be too broad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so ideally, you know, kind of make me sitting back here as the project manager. If I could get, like I said, five to seven people committing ten to fifteen hours from now till October fifteenth to help me on this piece, the the, the the scoping piece, that would be fantastic. Once the MOOC is in uh, up and running, um, I've actually been reaching out and talking to people who facilitated MOOCs, and they said it it sounds a lot a lot more hands on than it actually turns out to be. Um, because mm -hmm. what they tend to, be, to do is aggregate questions. So you'll see a, a patterns of questions and you address them through a webinar or through a series of questions. And so um, from a facilitation standpoint, that will all pretty much fall on me plus a handful of facilitators. Where we need the subject matter experts is when we don't know the subject matter. So if it's a design related question, we're able to field it and move on. If it's a question regarding um, specifically the, the adult basic education content, um, that's when we would ask for Absolutely. a small panel yeah. to be able to devote. And again, during the course of the five weeks MOOC, if you could set aside two to three hours a week, probably even one to two hours maybe, one to two hours a week during the five week MOOC, um, that would probably be, if again, if we can keep that sweet spot of five to seven on our panel. That would be mm -hmm. my, off the top of my head, estimate I think is probably pretty a pretty good starting point. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jennifer, uh, uh, who are, if I were to commit to this, uh, uh, who other would be the design reviewers? You, I, who, and Jason, who else? Yeah, we've got um, it, some of the folks that um, weren't able to join us today. Okay. Um, we have uh, Wendy Gentry, who was uh, the facilitator in, in the last uh, session, Yvonne Earn. Um, Earnshaw has raised her hand. Um, Jill mentioned yesterday, and I've re been reaching out to Brett Cook, who is an instructional designer. He's got his PhD. Um, I would say most of the people, that, uh, John Baki. Um, uh, okay. Person. So we've. It, so, it, so we're not talking just you and me. That's all I wanted to know. Oh no no. Again, <laughs> okay. if, if I could get a panel of five to seven designers, five to seven. Okay. Um, five to got seven it. sneeze. That would be fantastic. I see. Okay. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you guys very, very much. And um, if, I, I think I, what I'll start doing now is just starting to continue my conversations offline with folks in email. But if you have any questions whatsoever, uh, find us on our website, designersforlearning.org. Click the contact, contact us button uh, if you don't know our email addresses. Otherwise, we'll talk to you soon. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Nice to meet you all. Bye. Bye-bye.